Hey, welcome to our YouTube channel and uh, to our series, Not What You Think. This is an examination of what Christians believe and maybe in a way you haven't ever heard before. Now, we're going to hit some serious topics and, uh, and, and, and these are topics that we all think about even when we're not aware that maybe we're thinking about something um, that deals with these issues. And it's called not what you think because sometimes we have this idea of what Christian of, of what Christianity believes, and it doesn't really spring from Christian history or Christian orthodoxy, but rather a popular misconception of some of the things that Christians believe. And we're going to talk about a difficult topic today, and it's called universalism. And uh, I'm going to try to do justice to this topic because there's a lot of fingers, tentacles to it that reach into different areas. So first of all, when we talk about universalism, let me say that in one sense, we broadly affirm universalism. Now before you get mad, let me, let me, let me say what I mean. From a New Testament perspective, when, when Jesus uh, comes to earth, there is this widespread perception that being part of the family of God meant that you had to be Jewish. Jesus himself said he came to seek and to save the lost house of Israel. And when he came he and died on a cross, he died very much as the Messiah, as Israel's representative. And at the very end, he said, go and make disciples of all nations. But it was very difficult for him to break outside of that Jewish circle. It took the most dedicated, vibrant, zealous Jew, a guy named Saul from Tarsus, to break out of that. And Saul begins his work amongst the Gentiles. And of course, in the Gentile world, his name would have been Paul. So the man you know as Paul goes and reaches the Gentiles. And now Christianity flows to Jew and Gentile. There is no longer a inside group for which participation in God's family is only available. So we broadly affirm that kind of universalism. We also broadly affirm it today. Last week we talked about predestination. And it's not a very popular word around here. And we broadly affirm universalism in that today God's grace is available for every human being. There is no pre-selected elect group for, for whom only salvation is uh, available. God's grace flows to everyone. We have a word for that. We call it prevenient grace. The grace that draws us the grace that calls us, the grace that protects us, the grace that makes it possible for us to respond to God's Spirit when He calls us. That's prevenient grace. It flows to everyone. And so in that way we broadly affirm universalism. For God so loved the world, not the pre-selected group, not the small group, but God so loved the world. Now let's talk about some other parts of universalism. And when I said the word, this might be where many of you went to uh, mentally. The idea that everyone shares an eternal life. Now, there are some biblical verses that could be interpreted this way. I'm thinking of Romans where Paul says, if because of the, the, the sin of one man, condemnation flowed to, to everyone, how much more then will all receive the benefits of God's grace? How much more? So you go, wait a minute, if, if, if all of humanity was condemned, doesn't that mean that because of what Jesus did that all of humanity gets to share an eternal life? This has been something that has flared up now and then all throughout Christ, Christian history. You can go back to origin and we have discussions of this. We still have discussions of this. A few years ago, there was a big splash made by a, a book by Rob Bell called Love Wins. Now, that was a big battle, a big intellectual struggle in the Reformed tradition. In our tradition, Wesleyan Arminian tradition, there were some people who got up in arms, but that's not our struggle. That's not even our battle. But let's talk a little more about that, about this idea of universalism. There's another finger of this as well. Some people have held, Rob Bell touched on this in his book, is that after we die, that God's grace will still be, uh, still be able to be responded to. That somehow in the afterlife, 
we will have the capability of responding to God's grace. This is where the divide starts to happen. While we affirm that God's grace flows to everyone, and we affirm that everyone will have the capacity to respond to God's grace, it's a different question altogether when we, when we start asking the question, is grace something that will be responded to after death? Now, let's pretend just for an, a minute that after death we are all given a chance to respond again and let's say that everyone does respond. Some, some might say, wait a minute, that's not fair. Let me just suggest that if we think it's not fair that we respond to grace and others, and, and others who didn't in this life do later, maybe we don't understand grace. We don't deserve it either. So what God does, God does. But let's talk about reasons to maybe doubt um, that potential. While we do want to affirm a vigorous um, expression of God's grace, we do also have to talk about the justice of God. There is an expectation in Scripture that uh, comes up again and again and again. The righteous are rewarded. The unrighteous are not. That's a consistent theme. At parts of Scripture, it's expressed in different ways. Those who um, participate through faith with those who do not. There's a divide. You get to maybe the book of James. Um, there's an expectation that, uh, of, uh, that, that faith must be accompanied by good deeds. Paul says in Ephesians, we are created to do good deeds. So those who have faith in the New Testament are expected to live it out. Our actions are expected to match. Yes, we access through faith, but if we just think because we've said a prayer or made a decision 20 years ago that that means I can live however I want now might be sadly mistaken. We get to the Gospels in the Gospel of Matthew, it's a different picture. In the Gospel of Matthew, those that act in a Christ-like way to the least of these are judged to be right, while those that ignore the least of these, those that ignore the needs around them, will be judged and found to be, have fallen short. So throughout the New Testament, there is this clear distinction between those who somehow um, meet a standard and those who fail to meet a standard. And I think all of us have this basic idea um, that in life, that there is a penalty for doing evil. We look around us and we see unfairness all around us. We see people who manipulate finances for their gain. We see politicians who manipulate so they're enriched at the expense of the people they're supposed to represent and we get angered. We see people who abuse women or do terrible things to children and, and, and we are angered and, and scripture is angered too that even says, boy, there's a special kind of judgment that comes to, the, to those that purposefully harm children. So there's this standard. The righteousness of God, the justice of God, seems to um, um, demand a standard. So do I affirm that God's grace goes to everyone? I do. Do I affirm that I'm not deserving of that grace? I do. I also affirm that no one is deserving of that grace. And yet God reaches out to us anyway. And if I think that I'm more deserving of someone else, then perhaps I don't understand grace. But if I also think that I can live however I want with no thought to my fellow man, no thought to the, the least of these among us, no thought to my Creator, I think I might be mistaken um, as well. I also want to say one other thing that I think con that, that get, gets underplayed, especially in the Reformed tradition, and that is this. If I believe that there is a vigorous grace, and if I believe that uh, uh, God's decision can overwhelm an individual, then maybe I might go down the road of universalism. I might go down the road that God's grace flows to everyone, and it doesn't really matter what I do. But I'm also a vigorous believer in free will. And as much as God's grace flows 
except me and everyone else, there are times in life when many of us just decide, I don't want anything to do with God. I don't want anything to do with my responsibility. I don't want anything to do with my fellow man. I'll live however I want to live, however I want to live it, whenever, and no one's going to tell me any differently. One of the main reasons why I don't think that God's will unit while well, every single human being gets to joy will get to enjoy eternal life is not because of God's part. I believe God wants all humanity to enjoy life and have life to the fullest. It's because I also believe in my free will and there's a lot of humanity that is thrown off God and says I want nothing to do with you. The last century has taught us that. There's a lot of people who are willing to inflict great pain for their own vision um, of utopia. The great vision of the New Testament is, is a new heaven and a new earth. The earth will be remade and renewed. And I think as many people as want to enjoy that will be able to enjoy that. But God will not force us into his great renewal over our objections. And I believe uh, universalism makes that mistake. We have free will. We can respond to God's grace. I'm not part of any predestined group. You're not part of any predestined group. And so I believe that we can respond, but I can also believe on the... Conversely, I believe we have the freedom to reject. And God will not force us into any kingdom, into any renewal that we do not want to play a part in. And so ultimately that's why I reject universalism because it rejects free will and free agency. I hope this helps. And I probably muddy the waters, and if I did, I apologize. So hey, uh, subscribe to the channel, like us at the bottom, and please feel free to ask us a question. We'd love to deal with it. This probably opens up a big can of worms, and I understand that. But there's room to talk about it here, and uh, this is the channel we want to do it. Hope you have a good week. We'll see you back here next week.